Right. Well, when Stuart asked me to talk about the practice of behavior analysis, I figured, well, the first thing we need is a definition. We need to know what we do, right? So I had to pull one. I, I sort of like this one. I like the one for the Model Act for Licensing Behavior Analysts. You want me to predict the future? I think this one looks pretty promising. Uh, basically, what we do is based on, on scientific research. Our treatment should be evidence-based. We conduct cultural assessments. We make sure that we help improve the quality of the lives of people that we... We're about a social significant improvements. We do a lot of good things. Now, we don't do sex therapy. We draw the line on certain things, okay? Um, psychoanalysis, we don't do that. So I think it's important when we look at the practice of behavior analysis, we talk about what we do as well as what we don't do. I think these are the, the factors that influence the practice of behavior analysis in Texas. Now, some of you may disagree with me. Uh, these are my own opinions. These don't reflect any of the places that I work at. Uh, I think that we have to look at the history of practice in order to predict what we're going to do in the future. I also think we need to look at changing demographics. We need to look at budget deficits. We're in sad shape in the state of Texas, let's be honest about it. Um, billing trends, expanding areas of practice, supply and demand. Right now I'm feeling like I'm in hot demand, you know, because the, the supply of behavior analysts is limited. I'm hopefully one day I'd like to retire, so I'm expecting those programs to gener generate more behavior analysts. And also, as our practice changes, I think we're going to encounter some interesting ethical conflicts. And so I'd like to highlight those. The first thing is, is I want to talk about past to predict future. Back in 1992, there was a Sunset Act, the Practice Definition of Psychology. And for those of you who don't know, in the state of Texas, the Practice of Psychology is a Practice Act. That means that you cannot do anything in that act, the definition of psychology. And they included behavior analysis in that definition. There were a group of us that were just riled up. We had to go do something about it. So we went to Austin. And we talked. And we indicated that behavior analysis should be taken out of the Practice Act, the definition of what psychologists do. And lo and behold, it was. I wasn't quite sure when we finished if we won or we lost. All I remember, though, is that guy, he held up a phone book, and he said, I do not see behavior analysis in this phone book. Well, guess what? If you look in a phone book today, you're not going to see behavior analysis in there. You may see some psychics listed, but not behavior analysis. Well, thank God for Gordon, we got a directory so people know how to find us. But you're not going to find us in the phone book. Um, thank God now we use technology. We get on the Internet. We don't rely on the phone book as much anymore, and that's a good thing. <laughs> what we did is it's, it, we jumped on it. We developed a registry. We had certification. Um, and then, I, Jeff, I'm sorry, I missed, the, I missed the part where you helped us out with the, the, the Medicaid waiver programs and helping so that behavior analysts could get paid for their work in working with the Texas Home Living Waiver and working with home and community-based services. That's important. That impacts practice. You're not going to do something if you're not getting paid for it, most likely. I don't know too many people willing to do pro bono, although right here, this is pro bono. There's no, no payment. <laughs> All of you for Texava, that's, you know. Um, we had the 2010 task force. Don was in charge of that. We looked at licensure. Are we ready yet? I don't think we are. But I think in the future we will be. And I think there are some things that we're going to need to do because being licensed will affect our practice. It will impact what we do. And hopefully we will learn from the psychologist's licensure. I would hope that there, in terms of if we get licensed as behavior analysts, that we will be able to have reciprocity in all states in the United States. You know, as a licensed psychologist in Texas, you may not be able to practice in Michigan. They may not have reciprocity. So those are things in the future to look at because that impacts our future. That impacts our future practice. That means maybe if you get licensed in Texas, you're going to have to stay in Texas. We're okay with that. 
Some of you people living in Michigan, come on down. Weather's nice. <coughs> we don't really have much snow here in Houston. Uh, the other thing is that the, with the changing demographics, with changing demographics, the rate of autism, according to the CDC, has increased. We have changed in society, increase in cultural diversity, also an aging population. All the cute children you work with, they're going to grow up. They're going to become adults. At the center, I work with adults. I work every day at the center with people who are diagnosed with dementia. Realize people are living longer. I remember when I was going to school, we were told that people with Down syndrome wouldn't make it to 30. I think the oldest person I worked with Down syndrome was in his 70s. Doing great. Um, so we've, and we've also seen an increase in dementia. It turns out that people with Down syndrome, about 50% of them by age 50, will have dementia. Then also when diagnosed with dementia, guess what the medical doctors want to do? Want to give them an anti dimensional medication. Well, guess what? That's considered a psychotropic medication. And when you, you all know in, in terms of in Texas, if they're prescribed a psychotropic medication, you must have a behavior program, must have some form of adjunctive therapy. So there are behavior programs for people with dementia. I work with people with dementia every day, and I can tell you that some of the technology that we have, we can help actually improve learning in the first, uh, in the early stages of dementia. We have things to contribute, and I think that's a good thing. This is just Texas population growth in terms of our population will, of course, skyrocket. We're going to have differences with regard to uh, diversity, and that's something that I think we're going to need to be respectful of. The other thing in terms of our life expectancy by the year 2050 will be about 83. So we're going to be a lot, living a lot longer than we are now. Another thing that's going to impact our practice, at least here in the next year, is the budget deficits. Texas has a budget shortfall, and that's going to involve reduced spending to DADS. DADS is the Department of Aging and Disability Services. A lot of us work in facilities that are funded by DADS, and those companies in terms of what the ICF, the Intermediate Care Facility for People with Developmental Disabilities, the Home and Community-Based Services, they may then look at reduced spending to psychology. If it's not mandated or required, guess what? They're probably not going to spend money on it. The other thing is, is if you work in HCS, Home and Community Based Services, you better make sure before you provide services that you've got hours on the plans or you will not be reimbursed. You've also got to learn about insurance and, and the things that go along with that. Also realizes that we've just started to get inroads into the schools. The schools are hiring BCBAs in the state of Texas. I remember when the schools wouldn't hire behavior analysts. They would say, unless you're an LSSP or a certified teacher, we don't want you. Now they're opening in their arms. They see what we can do for them, and they've opened up positions. But realize when times get tight and schools get less money, I, I hope that this doesn't come to play, but just be prepared. And I would, and if they, they look at reducing full-time, I go to consulting. Do what you can. Always hang on because they need us and they will eventually turn around. The other thing is, is that companies may reduce travel. I can tell you that my budget travels reduced. And so you have to pay for your own. You have to get creative. Um, that's why I have a private practice. This is, a, this is an expense. It's a good expense. I would encourage you, even if your agency doesn't pay for your travel, to still come. It's very important, especially for the social aspect, as Dr. Malat mentioned, the social glue. That's very critical to our profession and our practice. So I would encourage you to come to conferences and not just get your CEUs online. That may happen. Um, billing trends. The, the billing trends in terms of this is significant. I, I work in, in um, treatment programs. Do you know that the private practice, in terms of private pay, the number of people who can afford pi private pay has reduced? People don't have that type of money. They're relying on insurance. The majority of people that I work with in treatment centers and clinics 
are going to pay with insurance. They're not going to pay with cash. So that's going to change in terms of what we do. Um, if we do look at licensure in terms of when we obtain it, realize this will probably open up in, term, in terms of insurance billing. Because insurance companies a lot of times do not want to pay for services unless it is rendered by an independent practitioner. As a certificate, we, as a certified behavior analyst, we're not a licensed independent pra practitioner. So a lot of insurance companies may not reimburse for services. That impacts our practice. If, and when we get to that point, now this may extend to the people who can't afford it, people who maybe who have Medicaid, Medicare. Um, thank God we have the Texas Medicaid waiver program, though. But this can impact us. The other thing is when we look at licensure, we may need, this will impact our practice. If you look at in the state of Texas, master's level independent practitioners, they have 3,000 clock hours after they obtain their master's in supervision. We don't come close to that. These may be factors that they may look at in terms of determining whether or not we can be independent practitioners. I think it's important for us to look at these aspects because this, again, impacts our practice. The other thing is, is that we're relying on insurance companies to pay us for what we do. We're going to need to look at the goals and the notes are going to have to meet the format. They're going to, insurance companies are going to come in and do a review of your services. Um, and what if they decide to take back money they've already given you because it doesn't meet their standard? This will impact your practice too. A lot of us in terms of, um, we're trained in psychology departments. We may understand the DSM-4 codes, well, soon to be DSM-5, and realize whatever the DSM-5 codes are, those are going to affect your, your diagnostics as well too. It certainly did in 94 when the DSM-4 came out. That impacts the people that you work with. So even though you're a behavior analyst and you may not understand the DSM-4 or soon to be DSM-5, you might want to clip in and understand it because insurance is, is medical model. And I'm sorry that's the case. But we as behavior analysts can learn. We're capable. The other thing is, <laughs> at least I'm I, I know everybody's trainable. Uh, will we look at sliding scale? What happens if you're providing services to someone who has insurance and all of a sudden they lose their insurance? Are you going to be willing to give scholarships? Are you willing to do more for less? Because there's tough economic times in Texas right now, and you may have to do more for less. Um, you know, in, a, in an agency, you may have to take a cut in pay. I had to take a cut in pay. And thank God the economy came back and I was able to then get my old salary back. But you have to be willing to commit. Uh, I would recommend that we commit to life. We commit to work with the people that we, we work with. These cute little children as they grow, commit. Continue to work with them. Don't just say they turned 18, they're not my responsibility anymore. This is a commitment. Um, I think that, too, that we will expand the areas of practice. Look at our technology, webcams, video modeling. I was at a clinic the other day, and a kid had an iPad as a reinforcer. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't have a clue how to use one of those iPads, but that kid loved it. So, I mean, Skype. I, the kid wasn't able to drive from Austin to see me. We Skyped him in in order for me to see the child. My God, this technology will improve what we do. Um, and the, in terms of children who have autism, other related disorders, they may have seizures, allergies. You know, I have, I've drawn uh, a graph for the doctors that I work with on seizures to, to help them out. I mean, I'm good at graphing. I can do that. I can show in terms of behavior problems that appear to be higher in, during allergy season and less when not. That's critical data that I can share with a medical doctor. And, I, and, you know, these ki kids and adults that we work with may also need OTPT speech, need to get friendly with them. Um, I've gotten friendly with the doctor I work with. I go get her coffee every time we start the clinic. I bring her food. I know about edible reinforcers, and I use it. When I worked at Denton as the chief psychologist, I improved the attendance for psychologists there by simply providing food at the meetings. I, I, I collected data on that, too. Um, I've had doctors write scripts that say conduct a functional analysis, um, write a behavior program. They write a script saying they want a behavior program for someone. 
That's what we need to do. We need to get out there and let people know what we're capable of. You know what I found out with medical doctors? They're trying to give medication, but if you give them other alternatives, if you teach them, tell them, hey, let me get a chance. I had a doctor one time tell me, you got three months, cross it. Get going. If you don't fix it in three months, they're mine. So, you know, take the opportunity. The other thing is, is work with the whole family. If you have a kid who comes into the clinic, but then they go back home, we need to also go back home with that kid. We need to provide services in home. Work with the whole family. That's how we can help things better. Um, and, and I want to thank, too, all the families out there that have trusted us to help their children. I appreciate that. Um, and I thank all the parents who have been active and involved in Texaba. Thank you. Uh, because you've done an excellent job in allowing us to be able to continue our practice. Uh, I think it's important, too, that we have an understanding and knowledge of supports available. Again, what happens if they can no longer afford for your services? Is there anybody out there who can provide the service that doesn't require insurance? What in, when they become adults, where are they going to go? They can come see me if you want. They live in Houston. Um, I serve adults. But does the Metro lift go there? These are all things you've got to know. Supply and demand. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing on expanding practice. I have to mention Al Poling. Al Poling was my mentor at Western. He's doing some interesting research with what is called hero rats, training nutria, uh, to sniff out bombs and TB in Africa. Man, that's fantastic. So I say go, out, go forth, expand our practice. Supply and demand. I, I keep seeing an increase in the membership of, of uh, ABAI. We have an increase in attendance at Texaba. What, what was it, about 500 people? That's fantastic. That's the largest we've had. That's up from over 100 from last year. We've also had an increase in the number of BCBAs in Texas. I'm really hoping that this, this increase in newcomers to the field will help meet the need. That's what I'm hoping. So for those uh, programs that train behavior analysts and send them to Texas or here in Texas, thank you. Thank you for helping it because the more people we have as, trained as behavior analysts, the less I'll have to work. And I'm all about that. So. <laughs> I'm hoping that this increase will, in fact, meet the need. And I think that probably continuing to educate the public as to what we do is important. I think we're going to enter in the future in some ethical conflicts that maybe we haven't faced yet today. I think that there may be some conflict with what we consider to be best practice, evidence-based, versus reimbursement. You haven't been exposed to it yet, but guess what? You rely on insurance, you will be, you will be someday. It's always stick to evidence-based treatment, and that will, that will save you when you're going through insurance company reviews. Also, in terms of realize that the old-timers were trained in departments of psychology. The newcomers are a lot not necessarily trained in psychology, may be in education, may have a master's degree in education and be a BCBA. Realize that there are increases in jobs in Texas. Thanks to the federal government, Department of Justice, there are increases in jobs at the supported living centers. Those jobs, though, in the past were held by psychologists. People coming into those jobs may be expected to do things that maybe they're not trained in. They may be expected to write psychological reports. So you have to make sure that you're clear on what you can and what you can't do. These are things that I see that might have an impact on us. The other thing is, is that in, you may be reviewed and critiqued by people who are not BCBAs. They may not understand what you do. It's going to be up to you to educate them, and that will certainly influence your practice. Um, and if you haven't been reviewed and critiqued by someone who has a bachelor's in social work, uh, who's an auditor, you will be. Uh, it's coming because, again, we rely on insurance. Long are the days of, of people having enough money to pay us cash. So. You know, and again, the, the one thing I want to stress in closing is I would really like for us to commit for
for life. Continue to work with these kids even as they, they age into adolescents and adults until the end. Thank you. I don't know how to. Uh, sorry, I'm not technical. I'm hands on. That's why those are adults who like an off <laughs> I don't actually know if you can see the graphic behind there. Can you see the pond? No, that's too bad. It's beautiful in the picture. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's my disclaimer, is that in high school, somebody gave me a copy of Walden 2. And um, so pretty much all of my behavior analytic activities are in the context of a better society through science. So, um, so with that, um, I, I do want to talk a little bit, and I'm going to shift around here because it's hard for me to go around the, <laughs> the computer. Um, I want to talk a little bit first about the role of universities in society. Um, and there are many people who have talked about this, but uh, fairly the consensus is, is that universities serve society as both servants, responsive servants, meaning that we are keeping a hand on the pulse of society presumably, and trying to respond to whatever society's needs are, and also as thoughtful critics. So those two, those two responsibilities on the part of, of universities have some special implications for behavior analysts. And I'm, this is like the slide that Dick showed yesterday <laughs> that I thought actually you would be able to read, but let me summarize. Um, the first quote is by Skinner uh, from Walden II talking about uh, using our knowledge about human behavior to create a social environment in which we can live productive and creative lives. Um, and to do that without jeopardizing the lives of, of future generations. The second quote is from UNESCO talking about the responsibility of scientists in modern society for using that knowledge toward the betterment of current generations and future generations. And um, what I would like to, to tell the choir <laughs> is that the science of reliably predicting and controlling behavior, I, I truly believe, and I think we all believe, is arguably one of the most important advances in knowledge uh, for human society. And I think sometimes, because we're a happy few, I, I think that frequently we don't understand the magnitude of what it is we're trying to teach the people that we're teaching in universities, and the magnitude of change that could come about by having a science of behavior. Um, not only for humans, but for all living organisms that are intertwined on this planet. Um, but like all sciences, what UNESCO was trying to tell us was that there's the potential to do great good and the potential to create bad and evil. Um, so looking at what behavior analysts might do with those university responsibilities, I, I think our first one above and beyond all is to effectively teach. Um, what we know about our science at this point and what we know about our practice. And at different levels, that will entail different things and for different designated areas. If, if I have a specialty area in autism, I should teach the best science and practice in autism that there is. For undergraduates, that will mean one thing. And for graduate students, that will mean another thing. I think also in addition to teaching the best of what we know, going back, that's the service part. The critical or the critic part, the thoughtful critic, is also pushing the limits of what we know with our students in terms of, as effectively as we can, teaching the contextual application analysis and pushing towards innovation in these areas. Um, I think we're fairly good at looking at the individual and their community. 
I think that we don't know very much or have not developed a science in terms of going across disciplinary um, and also cultural communities, looking at what the effects are and how to produce behavior changes in groups of people, um, still looking at individual behavior, but also what the collateral effects of, are, of individual behavior changes. Um, and then also looking at behavior within global communities. The second point um, is something that actually Dan Bernstein has been talking a lot about uh, in the past and recently is that to look at our teaching, like I think what Dick presented yesterday about his undergraduate and his graduate programs was very impressive. I think though we don't have a study of what different types of arrangements of training our students, what kind of behavior that produces, what kind of generalized behavior that produces, and what kind of things they're able to go on and do. Yes, most of our students are being trained in autism, but are there ways that we can train the students to be effective in the treatment and intervention of autism, but also that they'll be able to easily generalize and jump to dementia, generalize and jump to sustainability, generalize and jump to other areas that are important to us as a planet. And we have very little technology, very little data for, for understanding what we do that produces the change. I think we can look at some programs, and there are obviously enduring programs within behavior analysis that have produced some of those changes, but how much of that do we need to replicate to create a new program? How much of that is superstitious behavior? How much of that is important to continue? I, I don't actually think we know. We, we know very little bit about the systems that produce those dream chasers or the love dicks. You know, what, what actually gets us that? Um, also with that, I'm gonna go back up to the Walden Pond goals. I, I think two things that always impressed me both about Thoreau and Skinner's conceptualizations was that there was a deliberate awareness design and experimentation with our own behavior. That's a new thing in human history to approach it that way. And that the process and the procedures for doing that are also new. When we're in universities, we have the good fortune of being at the cutting edge of trying to figure out that method really crude what we're doing now, but when we are teaching and educating behavior analysts, the next level of that is to observe and study our own behavior and what it takes to produce someone who can go on to, to give us some generative outcomes. Okay, I apologize for those of you who are not Star Wars geeks, but I, I, I would like to say probably what Skinner was looking at was that We've had enough of this, both in our current lives. I, I think what, what's imploding all around us is, is a lot of bad behavior and behavior that maybe we could understand alternative ways to approach things. And so I think what, what we're looking at is, is how to figure out how to produce more Yodas, basically, more, more individuals who can go beyond immediate consequences, more people who, who are like the panelists today, talking about doing more and doing more for the greater good and in the future. Um, that's actually my closing note, but I, I, I do want to add, um, and like Gordon, I'll probably tear up, but uh, Jim was a master Yoda, and um, I think he was a really good example, and probably a quarter of you in this room are a product of a master teacher who produced generative outcomes. Yeah, that's it.
twice as wide, but I think at least nationally. Uh, which, uh, and, uh, but a lot of what you're saying, not all, but a lot of what you're saying is context, is, is said within or really within the context of Texas. And I don't think you should take that out, uh, but somehow uh, say, you know, here's the way it's working here, and here's what we're thinking about it. Most of it's going to apply to wherever you are. And, uh, uh, and now, okay, why don't you guys in Michigan or Illinois or wherever do another kind of little follow up on this? Uh, you know, I, I think if you, know, if you put this in uh, the other journals uh, and get the right context and so forth, I think it would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'd be interested in y'all's uh, perceptions of what the future holds for positive behaviors as well. That's behavior analysis, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Actually, they don't necessarily consider themselves to apply behavior analysis. Uh, and they pretty much divorce themselves from, from this organization. Uh, Can they bill insurance for that? <laughs> Let's just be straight up front. I don't know. I, I don't think they can. I, I actually am not sure all of them have divorced themselves from us. So I'm here, and, and I read their journal. And I, I don't know if I would still say they, we, me. I, I do think in general, and one of the things from the perspective of a faculty member, is I, I don't think we should be so afraid of variability. I, I, I do think that's an issue um, because we're in the business of control and predicting and controlling behavior. I think sometimes, myself included, that sometimes we try to narrow our box a little too much and not not let things bubble and see what stays, what goes. Um, so I think with PBS as well as Precision teaching or all the, the areas that have produced controversy in our our discipline over at least the last 25 years I've been here, um, I think we should freak out a little less about it um, and and try to be a little bit more inclusive, which is hard when groups are very different and antagonistic sometimes. Amen. Uh, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying about expanding our area. Uh, you're not saying we should go into sex therapy, as I understand. Is that correct? <laughs> no, because it's excluded from the definition of behavior analysis. Now, if we want to throw it in there. Um, no, but you're going to have to be trained. I mean, the idea is you don't practice in areas that you're not trained in. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, some things are natural. <laughs> Uh, you know, as a, where I work at, I'm responsible to help dispense uh, condoms. Uh, the nurses also do that, too. I work with adults. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so <laughs> my, 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 my. I don't teach enough. I understand. Um, but so you clarified the part of where you're not wanting us to go. So where are the areas that you're suggesting we go? I heard you talk about dementia. Which implies aging. I mean, I, I guess right. I, I, I think that. Well, I mean, I, I, I like working in the field of autism. It's just as, as I've gotten older, I can't catch up with those kids. <laughs> one time I was working at MHMRA, and one of the kids ran over to Dr. Schnee's office. He's the executive director. I, I had a lot of egg on my face because I couldn't catch her. <laughs> so, but no, I still think that we will continue in the field of autism, but I think that the children with autism will grow up. They're going to become adolescents, adults. Uh, we're going to need to follow them throughout their life. And so I think that now a lot of people work with children. I think that we're going to be working with adolescents, adults, um, and with aging, with the aging process. I don't know about you, but I take a lot more medication now. So, you know, aging comes with issues. How are you going to explain to somebody they need to have a colonoscopy? That's one of the things i got to do when I get back to work. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> These are things that as we age, as behavior analysts, we're going to be expected to address behavior problems. This person has a problem. They're not complying with the colonoscopy. So these are things that we're going to have to look into. These, In terms of age-related behavioral diseases, obesity, diabetes, 
hypertension. These are all things that, in terms of behavior analysis, can contribute to. Are you speaking primarily with respect to persons with developmental disabilities, or are you speaking more broadly? I guess that's where I'm coming from. Well, I think that, and again, this doesn't reflect anybody's opinion but mine, is that if we become licensed to practice independent in the future, not only when we be able to serve people with disabilities, but also, quote, unquote, people without disabilities. Because then we'll be seen as an independent practitioner, and we'll be able then to be reimbursed for services, and we'll be acknowledged that we have something to contribute. Not that we aren't now, but, you know, the hospitals aren't welcome in their arms and posting positions for behavior analysts. Hopefully one day, maybe they will. They'll find out, you know, that we can just be as good as that social worker they got on staff, which I understand the social workers now can write behavior programs in the class program. I was hoping we would have won that battle. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. As an autism interventionist, I think there are also some areas of autism that are very, very important to the rest of the world, and I think one of those is the behavior of being able to take another person's perspective, however we end up operationally defining that. But that, you know, if you're talking about someone from Israel and Saudi Arabia, that would be a good skill to have. Or someone from, I don't know, Mexico and the United States. But there are a lot of cultural issues that I think some of the things that we study in autism may have great applicability in other areas that are important to the rest of the world. And so I think that we can use the autism as a bridge to understand things that will help in other ways. I think the one that you brought up in the context of disabilities, but gerontology and aging, you know, that's probably one of the biggest areas. And we can help in your research there. We can do some good. We can do a lot of good. Can I just point out that Texaba, in fact, early on in Texaba, one of the pioneers in behavioral gerontology was involved at the founding of Texaba. It's Richard Husha. He did some great work. Unfortunately, not necessarily. When Sarah Bloom did her talk the other day, she mentioned that in Utah they had a two-part sequence for teacher education. And I was just wondering if that was something that the University of Utah assisted. Because I'm a teacher, a special education teacher in a BCA, and I see teachers struggling with behavior, you know, an overwhelming amount of their day. But when I go to talk to them about reinforcement, things like that, they don't understand it the way a behaviorist understands. You know, they think of it differently. And I was just wondering if that's something the University of Texas are considering. Can you repeat the question? Actually, Sarah Bloom presented yesterday, and she was talking about how the acceptance of the public schools for some of the work that she's doing, and part of that was she pointed out there are really only three universities training the one, training the special education teachers, and all of those teachers have been through two courses in behavior analysis. I actually don't know what the requirements are in special education. I know in our university they do take courses in applied behavior analysis if they're in the autism track, but I don't know if they do in the other tracks. I don't think they do. And I don't know what the mechanism is. Jen, do you have? Well, just a little bit of information related to that. At least in Houston and in other areas, we're trying to provide coursework for teachers in particular because there is that need. So we're developing some online courses in applied behavior analysis for those teachers in particular, but they fit within the undergraduate coursework in psychology. And our comment or point about the language that we use in applied behavior analysis, I teach at Sun University. I'm in the College of Education, so I'm in the closet. Or I wouldn't have gotten the job. They're not, you know, that's not the way they roll. But I'm respected in that. And so I teach a course called Classroom and Behavior Management. And that day, if you accept it, if it was applied behavior analysis, it would not be nearly applicable to my college. But within that class, I use very little of the language 
you that I heard in this conference that I hear others speak, but I get the feedback, <coughs> the feedback from my students after they start teaching. Oh, I love that ABC thing you taught me. <laughs> <laughs> that works so well. My principal loves that I know how to take data on these kids with behavior disorders or do it. You know, and so I really think that there's a gap between the experimental aspects of ABA and the, some of the very, I mean, get down practical uh, practices that we talked about. I went to some of the things um, her students presented, and I couldn't keep up with the language. You know, I feel, I feel like I have the background, I feel like I have the basics, I feel like I can teach teachers how to use them, but I could, I mean, I barely could keep up with some of the experimental um, language that was being used. And I think you need to work on that. Well, it's related to that. I, I agree with that comment, but it's also, uh, I think, important to hold on to our technical language, uh, which we can use ourselves, but we can translate that to others. So I think in that situation, it was more speaking amongst ourselves. But uh, it's related to, uh, <coughs> because I was there. <laughs> so, uh, uh, related to the comments that both Anna and Shala made about a lot of people being recruited into the field through the office, including myself and Shala talking about trying to get some, uh, yeah, teach people generalized skills that are generalized to other content areas. It just occurred to me that, and probably maybe somebody's already done this, that you know, somebody might want to collect some data on that actually try to figure out like, how many people that uh, were recruited through office and been trained primarily in office and were able to work or have worked on other problems like I'm not as well as the she was trained on But uh, how does that look? I mean, this relates to kind of stock, you know, when you're turning into a field of office. And, uh, well, the good news is that we're recruiting more people in the field. But it's only good news well, it's, it would be better news if they were then able to use uh, either analysis in the process. So, I don't know. Maybe I should go ahead and say that. If I could, if I could just um, add uh, related to, because I think that's a hugely important issue, the, uh, the uh, going back to the, the language issue. I think that is hugely important, and I think what we might need to do a better job with in graduate programs is training students to essentially have two verbal repertoires to speak our technical language when it is appropriate, when the audience is appropriate, but also, and I think we do a very good job of that already, but I think we also need to train them to, to speak a very different language, and I think we need to train this explicitly, because it doesn't necessarily come. Uh, it doesn't just happen, you know, just because we, we can't speak plain English when we're talking about something other than behavior analysis. It doesn't mean that we can, you know, explain what we do. and. Uh, talk about what we do, and I think, you know, this is something that may need to be trained explicitly. I'd like to follow up also on the on the language issue. Uh, it's, it's been a hot-button issue for me for many years, and only recently I learned of its relevance in the healthcare field, um, when actually all of us here had the opportunity to attend a lecture given by a physician at Children's and she was presenting on something that's called healthcare literacy and showed very much data on um, not taking for granted what the patient understands and changing the way you actually talk to the patient um, so that you don't give them the opportunity to just answer with uh, closed end, or you don't give them closed ended questions where they can say yes, you're very typical. I'm sure we've all experienced the physician in the office says, okay, now. Um, take these two times a, a day uh, for the next six weeks. Do you understand? Yep, I got it. Door. Now what they're teaching them to do is to say, how are you going to take this? And have that person tell it back. We, the presumption is that if they can tell it back to you, then they're that much closer to being able to do it themselves. So we may want to practice something similar to that when we send a parent out of our office and say, okay, now how are you going to respond when Billy hits himself in the head and make sure that they, they can understand. Again, we have, we have to balance not losing our, our footing in a technical world, um, but be willing
willing to give up some of that decision when we're talking with uh, some of our, our patients and our clients. <coughs> Dr. Grosset, going back yes. to the future of ABA and seeing how you speak of your relationship with these physicians, mm -hmm. do you see any interest on their part to ABA maybe applying it to their patients, for example? Yes, absolutely, clients? yes. And do you know of any interest on behalf of the ABAs to maybe have programs for physicians? Well, I can only speak in terms of with the physicians that I work with, and they seem very interested in uh, applied behavior analysis and also implementing technology uh, because they see how effective it is. I think that takes uh, time to build relationships. Realize that the particular physician I work with, I've known for over, over 25 years. And so I think if we establish relationships, develop rapport, uh, I think that in time, <coughs> people will respect what we do. But it takes time and be patient. It wasn't always the case. And so I think it does take time. But I think that with time and establishing relationships that you can build that and that people of other disciplines will be more <coughs> respectful of what we do because they'll see what we do works. Susan, when I was growing up, my pediatrician said, uh, when I take the kids in, said, you only remember 20% of what I'm telling you. So every time I went in, whether it was an earache or what, he tell me the stuff, and then as I left, he gave me a handout. So it may be that, you know, there, there's, if you have set uh, interventions, you give them a little brief summary of, of what you've told them. I have a whole book of earaches and earaches and earaches. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of off the path I'm not taking yet this morning. Um, I'm the first one who can relate to behavior analysis, so I'm a student in the master's program. Um, and what I really wish is that I had the skill to use behavior analysis in my life. I'm learning how to use it with a special population in, in, a, in a very focused area, but um, I had never really practiced uh, I never used the laws of behavior previously in a way that was, was effective and efficient for me. Any suggestions? I have one. Um, we actually have a, a, a big expert on um, using behavior analysis in the everyday life, sitting right there talking a lot. Um, so, so, so I would suggest checking out his. Uh, uh, his book, for example, the procrastination book. Um, I forget what the title is. I'll stop procrastinating when I get around to it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, probably a free download. Yeah, I, I believe it is because I have downloaded it somewhere. So it is a it is a free download on his website. But but yeah, I mean, I, I'm not speaking from personal experience, so I'm not good at that either. <laughs> I think um, that well, you have a good point, and I think I do look at things. Uh, one of the things I did when I first learned about this is I took data on every child in my classroom who got out of their seat. And when I took it to my, my supervisor, he said, do you have a problem with every child in your classroom getting out of their seat? And I said, no. And he said, well, then why are you taking all this data? Uh -huh. <laughs> and I think that's a good point. I think it is good to be able to apply it to our new monitors. But I also think it's when we're working with children, children with autism who have problems, when we're working with people with dementia who have very serious problems getting through the characters' lives, we need to know more technically what we're talking about. Maybe you don't need, you see what I mean? I, I think it's going on anyway. I'm not saying it isn't all happening anyway. But I think a lot of times we need to, it's like me taking data on every I think I want to add something to that. I think that's actually another application area that we could expand. Um, there are people out there like coaches. You know, there, there are a lot of people out there who are attempting to help people live better lives and meet goals that they have in their personal life, from everything from yoga to, to crystals. Um, and I think that probably we have something to offer there, and that could be another area that we expand. And I know that um, 
like at UNT, there's, there's actually a program, the Instructional Student Mentoring, um, that Jesus and his students have been working on, but teaching students who are having a hard time, or not having a hard time, but just want to do better, to be able to set goals and improve what they're doing and be happier in their lives. So I think, and there have been a number of programs like that that could be capitalized on, and that I actually think could be careers for, for our students that we're training. Um, It's along those same lines that uh, of what the last few people have been saying. I, I really feel like as behavior analysts, we impact the world constantly in whatever we are doing. And and while we may have jobs that are designated as behavior analysts, any job that any of us or your students or future students get, I don't care what they're doing, if they behave from a behavior analyst standpoint, they're going to be expanding into the world. And so mm -hmm. that's, I think, part of what I was responding to before this, I was listening to you, is it doesn't matter what the job is. I mean, you could be working in the city planning office, but if you're if you're using the principles to impact the people that you're working with, and then maybe impact the policy, then we're still, we're still spreading what we do. But Betty, I, I think one thing I would ask that is that you had a particular type of training. You had multiple exemplar training, and, and I think my hunch is, I don't know if it's right, but that has something to do with you approaching whatever you go into from a behavior analytic viewpoint or set of skills. And I'm not sure all of the students being trained now to pop into another thing, because even when you see their interactions in other contexts, they're behaving from other, other, you know, what you call sources of training or viewpoints or, or histories. So I, I think we need to understand more what would make someone go into another setting um, and be able to respond that way. And, and do you think that's a training issue within the education format? That, that even that, that is a suggestion of this, this can be a truth wherever you happen to be. Experiment with that and let's see. And to that. use those skills. And I see some of our students do that beautifully. We had one recently who, who went to a junior college, which is not typically where our students are employed, and created this whole mentoring system for students who were at risk for not making it in junior college. That was not necessarily a total package she learned going through our program, but she went across many different application areas from from non-humans to the constructional student mentoring and different areas. So I see that our students get that. I'm not sure that they don't all get that. So I'm not sure what the combination of training is that would produce someone who could go into a very different area. My guess is it's the problem solving. Back over there, um, to address what you said about using it in your personal behavior, not in your personal life, I think it's a process. Um, and um, I think for myself, it's been a process, and then um, part of it has been um, just kind of having other behavior analyst friends who can see things that way and hear them talk about uh, their lives in terms of behavior analysis, and it kind of helps you. And,